When you're entering the world of sales, you probably think all sales gigs are alike. But in reality, saying you're in sales is like saying you play sports. What sport do you play? Being a bodybuilder is a very different sport than being a football player. Do you play water polo, basketball, baseball, cricket, chess? All of the above are considered sports. But the daily life of someone who plays water polo is very different than the daily life of someone who plays cricket. And more so, the sport you play is probably something you're naturally dispositioned to be better at. Right? If you're terrible with your feet, but great with your hands, you're probably more likely to want to play baseball than you are soccer. And if you hate swimming, you're probably less inclined to want to play water polo. If you hate physical contact, you probably don't want to be a boxer. These are all things that we think of as second nature because they're physical, they're tangible. But the same exact thing is true in sales. You have different types of sales. You have remote, in-person, B2B, B2C, biz off, high ticket, low ticket, phone, Zoom. And just like you'd avoid sports that don't resonate with you or play to your attributes, you should probably avoid sales that don't resonate with you or play to your strengths. But to do that, you have to understand what types of sales there are, how they differ, how they're alike. What sales are best for people looking to build relationships? What if you're trying to connect with people emotionally? Every game of sales has a different rule book and methodology, strengths that you need to have in order to succeed. So today, we're gonna go over the different types of sales, helping you understand which is gonna play to your strength. And in the rest of this phase, how to find businesses that meet those types of sales, that need people like you playing for their teams. Roll intro. Okay, setting agenda for today's lessons, we're gonna hit three main topics. Remote versus in-person sales, B2B versus B2C sales, and lastly, high ticket versus low ticket. And what's cool about those six methods is that they all intertwine. You can be a high ticket B2B salesperson or a low ticket B2C salesperson. Games within a game, gameception. Anyway, point number one, it's gonna be super quick, remote versus in-person sales. And let me preface by saying, as you can probably tell by the name of this program, that everything we go over is gonna lean more toward remote sales. It's my personal bias. Remote sales tends to have an average higher income, an average higher income ceiling. It also allows you to live anywhere in the world so you can play the game of currency arbitrage, taking your income even further. But more specifically, remote sales has more intentional sales conversations. Having been on the receiving end, I can't stand it when I go out and have coffee with someone that I haven't connected with in a while and the conversation turns into financial advisory or life insurance. Just grimy and it's dirty. The more, I really, I just feel like it's out of date. But when you're selling remote, when you're a remote sales rep, people hop on Zoom with you and they know why they're there. They have intention of solving a problem and possibly buying a service. They know that when they get on that call with you, that there's the possibility that they buy something. When you're selling in person, it's like asking a girl that friend zoned you 10 years ago to hang out and then trying to take that hangout and turn it into a date. But remote sales, it's like Tinder. There's intention. They, they know what they're doing. You know what you're doing when you swipe that app. I hate Tinder, by the way, but it's the best analogy that I think I could come up with for that case. It goes without saying that I obviously believe in remote sales more, that that's my bias. I think objectively that it is the better way to go. But that said, there are a few benefits to in-person sales and we'll go over them. Number one, it's much more relationship-based. If you're the kind of guy that wants to find a wife and you find the perfect girl, you know that that is the person you wanna have be your wife. And your game plan, your workbook, is to befriend that person for five, 10 years, and then eventually try to make them your wife. In-person sales might be for you. Or if you're the kind of person who wants to make a sale and then stay connected to that person for life, in-person sales might be for you. But in-person sales, it's not always the case, but oftentimes it's the opposite. It's personal first, business second. It's much more relationship-based. The more I talk about it, the more I start to realize I just don't like in-person sales. I, I don't even consider it sales at this point, but I digress. Another benefit, and it sounds like I'm being sarcastic when I say this, but it really is a benefit to a lot of people, is that in-person sales means office life, which means office camaraderie. I still remember the days back at the dealership the banter, the drinking after work, the going out to lunch, the just the overall the hanging out with the other reps when things were slow. And they truly are great memories. I don't miss them at all, but they're great memories. And the reason I don't miss them is because I also remember working on holidays when all my friends and family were out having fun and me, I was stuck in an office. It was dead, but I had to be there. But a lot of people, truly, they want office life. They want that camaraderie in person. And you get camaraderie and office culture and such in remote sales, but it is different. Other than that, I truly don't see a single benefit of in-person sales over remote. I'd much rather be able to take calls anywhere in the world, whenever I want, with people who actually have an intention of speaking over the problems that they want to solve. But maybe that's just me. Anyway, in-person versus remote sales, if you are unequivocally the person who wants to have long-term relationships or office life, then in-person 
sales is for you. Otherwise, to everyone else, strongly recommend you probably look the remote route. Moving on, topic number two, B2B versus B2C. Business to business versus business to consumer. Business to business is when a business sells a solution to another business that usually helps them make or save money. Think anything from like accounting to software as a service. Where B2C, business to consumer, is businesses selling to everyday people. Think anything from credit repair services to backyard luxury kitchen installations. It can be selling fat loss to dating coaching. The possibilities in B2C are truly, truly endless. And technically there is a game in the middle. It's called BizOp, Business Opportunity. And it's a very small industry, so we're not gonna focus on that today. But it's when you're selling to consumers who want to be business owners. It's a great field, but it is a smaller industry. It's not gonna be a majority of what you can see out there on the market. And so we'll hit that later in the series. Today, we're gonna to focus on B2B versus B2C. Those are the two key players. And unlike in remote versus in person, there's no right or wrong here. Both are great games, both are great sports, but they're very different and they play to very different strengths. And so we wanna make sure that the one you pick is the one that's gonna play best to your natural attributes. So let's break it down, starting with B2B. The main word that holistically encompasses B2B, business to business sales, is logic. When you're selling to businesses, you're selling them on a logical path that will get them from A to Z. Whether it's helping them, again, save money or make more money, you have to be able to show them that your solution will either be able to make them more money, and you have to logically break that down as to how, or you have to be able to show them how your solution can get the same results as what they're currently paying for, but at a lesser cost. In B2B, the stronger the logic is, the stronger the chance of the sale is. In B2B, you get deep into numbers, why margins are thin, why they're losing revenue, team efficiencies, overspending on tax. B2B always comes down to a business wanting to make more money or be more efficient with the money that they're spending. B2B is all about logic, and it's about destroying illogical fallacies, building logical pathways. And of course there's emotion, but the emotion is founded in the logic. It's concrete logic. But business owners, of course, still feel excitement. They still feel relief. But it stems as a byproduct of logic. And in case you haven't noticed, I've said that one word quite a few times, logic. Logic encompasses B2B. And personally, I've always gravitated toward B2B. Numbers and logic have always been kind of how my brain works. I've, I make decisions logically. Even in emotional situations, I logically make decisions. Numbers, I've always loved numbers. I love getting into numbers. They've, that, the kind of conversations I have have always thrilled me when I'm talking about numbers. It's weird, but it's who I am. So I gravitate to B2B like a seven foot five lanky armed guy would gravitate toward basketball. But at the same time, if numbers and talking about margins and team inefficiencies and logic, if that bores you, that's cool. No judgment, it's not for everybody. Again, if you're good with your hands and not with your feet, you're probably more likely to wanna to play basketball than you are soccer. I might just be better with my feet than I am with my hands, I'm playing another sport. And so if that bores you, if logic bores you, then the other side is B2C, business to consumer. And the main word that encompasses B2C is emotion. See, unlike in B2B, in B2C, the logic is already known. And so you're playing with different battles. You're conquering disbelief and you're building emotional buy-in. Let's use fat loss for an example. Let's just say you're selling a 12-week fat loss program. Logically, I think every human knows how to lose weight. You have to move your body and eat less or get lipo, but we're gonna pretend that's not a, an option for this one. And every person looking to lose weight already knows that. So you can't stress and sell on the logic. But instead, and especially in B2C, they need sales reps like you that can help them conquer their disbeliefs. The little voice in the back of their head that says, you're not good enough, you can't do this. Or they need someone to help them paint that vision of them with their dream bodies on the beach in summer, getting all the good looks when their shirt's off or they're in the bikini. In B2C, you're helping people conquer that voice in the back of their head or you're helping them paint that vision that builds the excitement for them to wanna to take action and change their lives. But it's emotional, it's not logical. We're not asking them how much they weigh, how many calories they're intaking a day and what their macro splits are. Instead, we ask emotional questions. How much do they weigh now? How do they feel about that? Are they comfortable with that? I'd ask what they can or can't do because of their weight right now. I'd ask what they wanna be able to do. I'd be pulling out that feeling of embarrassment or shame that they're feeling on a day to day and letting them talk about it like I'm a therapist and then building that relief or that joy or showing them what it would feel like 12 weeks from now if they did take action and change their lives. Even as I'm saying this, my tone is changing because I'm being more empathetic toward the situation. I'm building emotional discrepancy. And that is what B2C is. Business to consumer is emotion. 
And this is why phase one, talking about ethics and having honor is so important because as we get into emotional selling, especially with B2C, now we're getting into something that could almost be unethical with your skills and strengths if you aren't putting it toward the right program or company. If you're selling something that is not actually helping people, if you're selling something that is not getting the results that you're promising, now we're getting into that unethical territory. And so when you get into emotional sales, when you get into raw feelings that people are carrying on a day-to-day basis, that's a super, super strong thing to be holding in your hands. It's a lot of responsibility. And you have to make sure in emotional sales and B2C sales that you're doing it for the right company. Otherwise, completely unethical. But if you're doing it for the right company, then I don't think there is anything more honorable because People need someone in their corner to help them change. People need someone that can help them understand that they are good enough, that they deserve a better life. You'd be amazed, most people don't have advocates in their corner saying, I know you can do this. And so I don't think there is anything more ethical or honorable than helping people if you know that the company and the program you're working with is good and actually delivers on what they're promising on. B2C, it's a great game in sales. You have a lot of personal impact with people and you get to, feel that impact with them and share their wins. Completely different, of course, than B2B, but there is no right or wrong. There's no better or worse here. It's whatever comes down to which is best for you specifically, which resonates best with you, which plays to your strengths best. And the reason I'm so adamant on saying this is because I see, I've seen hundreds, thousands of reps probably at this point burn out from sales because they played the wrong sport. I saw basketball players playing soccer and soccer players playing baseball. And when people play the wrong sport, a sport that doesn't resonate well with them, a sport that doesn't play to their strengths, their attributes, then they just think they're not good at sports. And so they just stop, they stop playing. But in reality, if you played the right sport for you, you could have crushed it. And so if you're an emotional person, if you're someone who wants to connect and have emotional conversations with somebody, B2B probably is not for you. In B2B, if you're selling to someone who's making $10 million a year with their business and they're coming with a sales team problem, their sales team is not closing enough deals, You can't ask them how they feel about that or to picture their sales team in 12 weeks closing more effectively. You can't ask them how that affects their family. Emotional questions, they don't don't come across in B2B as authentic. And that's not what they're there for. They're not there for emotional buy-in. They're there because they logically have to fix a problem. And so instead you have to talk about why their team isn't efficient anymore. Was their team efficient before and what's changed? How does the inefficiency play out into the rest of the business? What's their sales process look like? Where might the holes be? That's a logical B2B conversation. And if that doesn't come naturally to you, then when you try to come up with it on the call, it's gonna be insincere. It's not gonna flow well. And you're always gonna be trying to do something that just fundamentally works against how your brain works. But on the flip side, if you're a logical thinker, then it's gonna be incredibly hard for you to go into B2C and have those emotional conversations. Because especially for me, it's very hard. It's very hard to ask a question about how does that make you feel? Or are you comfortable with that? Picture yourself in 12 weeks meeting me in a coffee shop and knowing that your credit is 800 and that you can have an Amex and swipe it and not have to worry about your credit score. How does that make you feel? Those to me, I just, it's corny. I don't, I don't like asking questions like that. To me, it's insincere, it's inauthentic and it's because my, it is insincere and inauthentic. I don't wanna be asking those questions. A logical person has a very hard time tapping into emotion. And so you have to play to your strengths, to your benefits, to your brain, to the way your brain is wired. In phase one, I talked about Ronaldo and Messi. Just take for a second, a quick little image in your head. Think about Ronaldo trying to play like Messi or Messi trying to play like Ronaldo and trying to drive a ball into the net from 30 meters away. If either of them tried to play like each other, they wouldn't be nearly as good. And that's because they'd be playing to someone else's strengths, not to their own strengths. The same is true in sales. The only reason that we actually don't think that way is because sales is a mental game. It's not tangible, it's intangible. And also because most reps just don't understand there are different types of sales, there are different sports inside of sales. And so just like you have to do in soccer or in football or in baseball or choosing what sport you wanna play, you have to play a sport that plays to your benefits, that plays to your strengths. If you're more logical, if you make relationship decisions based on logic, if you buy logically, if you think logically, B2B is probably the better sport for you. Vice versa, if you shoot from the hip, go from your gut, empathize with people, sit down and have really long empathetic conversations, B2C might be the better route for you. There's no right or wrong, B2B versus B2C, they're both great games. There's only right or wrong for you. And lastly, topic number three, high ticket versus low ticket. Technically mid ticket. Are you selling something for $1,000, $10,000, $20,000? 
$10,000, $100,000? Making this point, it's kind of like B2B versus B2C. There's no right or wrong. It's just whatever works best for you, whatever resonates best. And also in this point, we're gonna probably wanna take experience. Just like with B2B versus B2C, there's no right or wrong on what ticket you choose, whether it's high ticket or low ticket. You wanna play on what resonates best with you, which is the best to your benefit. And making this point is less wordy than with B2B versus B2C, but the same logic applies. It's whatever is best for you. There's no right or wrong. The game here is that you do wanna factor in experience though. In low ticket, you have more sales, which means more repetition, which means faster learning curve. And in high ticket, you have less sales, which means less repetition and thus slower learning curve. Let's think car dealerships for a second. Take Honda. At Honda, you might be selling 60 or 70 cars a month, which means you have people walking in the door every single day, dozens of people walking in the door, and every single person you have a sales opportunity with. And what happens is you fuck up a lot. Let's say for a second it takes 1,000 fuck ups for you to get good at sales. So at Honda, let's say you have 15 people walking in the door and you fuck up with 50% of the people coming in. It takes six months to get those 1,000 mess ups out of the way. But on the other side, let's say we're selling for Lamborghini. Let's say instead of 15 opportunities a day, we get 15 opportunities a week. And if we're fucking up at the same percentage, instead of taking six months to get our reps in, it takes us two and a half years to get our reps in. And let me backtrack for a second by saying, I know we're talking about messing up and fucking up, but that is the only way you learn. It's gonna happen. For anyone going through this program, just know fucking up is inevitable. The game when we're first starting should just be expediting the timeline on which we're fucking up in. And for that, in terms of experience, if you're first starting in sales, I really recommend you go low ticket and you get those reps in. And even if you're not just starting, if you're still experienced, low ticket is still badass. You can make as much money selling a $1,000 offer as you can a $100,000 offer, hands down. The only difference in income is the methodology that you play with because in low ticket, you have more repetitions, you have more offers, you have more opportunity. You have a shorter buying cycle. People are usually buying on the call rather than in high ticket where you might have a six month buying cycle. In low ticket, you have instant gratification. I actually, pre I prefer low ticket. I don't know if you can tell, I am a huge low ticket fan. But anyway, so if you're first starting with experience, I highly recommend low ticket. And if you're experienced, I still really do recommend low ticket, but High ticket is a great game too. So we'll get into it. For the sake of just kind of putting numbers on these, let's say that low ticket is anything less than 5K, mid ticket is five to 10K, and then 10K plus is high ticket. And really those numbers change based on the industry that you're in. I've seen high ticket be $100,000. I've seen high ticket be a million dollars and $100,000 is mid ticket. It really com it comes down to what you're selling in. But for the sake of just these examples, less than five is low, five to 10 is mid, 10 plus is high. And what you'll see is the higher the ticket that you go, the more complication and the longer the buying cycle becomes. If you're selling a $100,000 product, it could take six months or a year of back and forth and different calls and different decision makers and multi-level processes to go through before you actually get a yes. Instead of chatting with decision makers right away, you're chatting to gatekeepers and you're going through resistance in order to get to the people who can actually say, let's do this or let's not. And the higher the ticket you go, you can come into logistical issues, whether it's supply chain around the world or lawyers reading contracts and amending them. The higher the ticket, and really this comes in mostly with B2B, but the higher the ticket, the higher the ticket, and you really only start to see high, high ticket in B2B, but the higher the ticket, the more the complexity, the longer the buying cycle, the more multi-level it is, the more resistance in the process. And that's not bad, it's just preference. I personally don't like to have to go through a 12 month cycle to get someone to get a yes. Even if the check at the end is huge and the impact that can make is huge, I personally like instant gratification. I like getting on a call with somebody and knowing right then and there that we can make a decision on whether or not we wanna take action on that call or not. And it's all preference. I personally don't like the longer buying cycles. I don't like the resistance and waiting one year and having all this constant back and forth before something happens. I like instant gratification. I like getting on a call and knowing that the person I'm talking to is the person that can decide whether or not we take action or not. I like knowing that 45 minutes from now, it's either a yes or a no. I'm an instant gratification kind of guy. But there are people who love getting deep and building the puzzle and finding puzzle pieces and putting things together and just spending one year, even if it's only on two or three prospects, spending one year working with just two or three people to get those big yeses. It's totally your choice as to which game you wanna play. If you wanna do machinery sales, churning eight, 10, 15 sales out a day versus two or three a year, 
low ticket might be the right one for you. If you don't wanna go super deep in your sales conversations and you don't wanna understand every nuance about the person or business you're talking to, low ticket might be for you. But if you're the kind of person who likes jigsaw puzzles and working on something for one year so that you get a big dopamine hit at the end rather than a ton of small dopamine hits, high ticket might be for you. It's totally your choice as to which game you wanna play. The one piece of input I will say on top of the two descriptions I just made is that I do feel with anything under 10K that your skill level will reflect more on in your income. What I mean by that is that when you're selling anything at 10K or less, your ability to overcome objections and to guide people to making decisions and talking to those decision makers, you have more control over the sales process and over the call. And because of that, if you have more control and you're better, that usually means that you can start to be more successful, if you will. Where with high ticket, there are things that are just out of your control. If you get into 100K programs and you have lawyers looking at contracts and there's something that a company just cannot do because it breaches a contract they have with another company, it doesn't matter how good you are, there's just nothing you can do about that. And so for me, that up to 10K mark, that's kind of been my sweet spot. That's what I've always preferred. And it's because I had control over the, the process, the situation. But to each their own. And Really, I know that this point was long-winded. I know this entire lesson was long-winded, but I thought it was extremely important to break down these six methods to you because I've never seen anyone else do it. And if you don't know what games there are in sales, then you could be the person who is playing basketball but should be playing football, or you're playing water polo but you should be a boxer. You can't pick the right sport for you unless you know that there are different sports to play and what those sports are. And so, granted, long-winded lesson, I promise, it's probably one of the more valuable ones in these first two phases. Pick the sport that's right for you, and I promise you'll be setting yourself up for success. And throughout this entire series, you'll be seeing that everything just comes more naturally when you're selling in a way that resonates with whether you're more logical or more emotional. I hope this helps. I hope it gives you some clarity on which sport you want to play inside of the beautiful game that is sales. And welcome to phase two. I will see you in the next lesson. Until then, happy hunting.